My Life in Orbit by Ken W. Simpson, 21 Turner Street. Our first house, a bungalow, was on the corner of Turner Street and Park Road, with roses in the front and a withered vine beside the back fence. I remember kindergarten at an old church hall, my first day at primary school, then the year at home, so my younger brother, with a stranger's personality, could be company, marching to the rhythmic rattle of kettle drums, playing cherry bobs and family holidays by the sea. Biquet Vale. Four poplars, evenly spaced, stood like sentinels outside our place, bisected by a gravel drive flanked by lawns and a pomegranate tree. Wild blackberries behind sloped to a wilderness below with a chicken shed converted into a clubhouse where we gazed at girly picks and compared directions. We were the side effects of Pop's success, passengers on his merry-go-round unable to get off. Enrolled at Scotch College, I passed through wrought iron gates along a snaking driveway and passed a copse of trees, a rugby pitch, and a memorial chapel to the assembly hall. Like a church inside, it had traditional pews, slots for hymn books, honor boards on the walls, and an aisle, down which the masters strode, draped in their academic gowns. My years there tend to merge in classrooms where masters sat at desks, inculating by dictating and playing sport in a house footy team, incapable of winning a game, scoreless for an entire season, apart from a rushed behind. Drifting. Aged 15, elated to be free, unqualified and without prospects, but insulated against adversity, I existed vicariously, a paradox in a suit and a tie waistcoat, hat and signet ring, traveling each day by train to Pomp's accountancy firm in the city to work as an audit clerk, checking receipts, invoices, vouchers and files, a mechanical marionette routinely anesthetized with a calculator instead of a mind. I had another life where I could fantasize at different places, at the movies, in other worlds, insulated from the daily grind with dreams of becoming an army officer that merged with an infatuation for Sybil, a colleague at the office. I invited home to, to dinner and hovered, blissful and inarticulate before walking her home where she left me abruptly, wordlessly, forever. Unable to qualify as an accountant, I found another job in the de dispatch department of a furniture store until I was dismissed two years later. Swinburne. I liked to draw and agreed when Pop suggested I study art at Swinburne. For the first two years, I studied design, copied casts, and drew the nude in life class before specializing. It was art based on the past, which suited me, draftsmanship, and the golden mean with little creativity. In between, I learned to box, played tennis on a city roof, had dancing lessons, and went camping. I fell in love with Mary and was so overwhelmed in life class. I fled to the nearby pub each model break to swallow a glass of beer before hurrying back. With no prospects of a career as a painter, I applied to teach as a temporary and was sent to Ekika. After three hours by steam locomotive, I arrived with nowhere to stay. I left my suitcase at the school when directed towards the river where adolescent boys splashed and cavorted inside a pontoon. Moments seemed suspended, a sort of limbo in the summer heat, before I was ferried around seeking accommodation at hotels and guest houses until Bill, a maths teacher, suggested I share his hotel room. At assembly the next morning, students intoned the oath of allegiance, saluted the flag, and were marched to classes. I was given a syllabus to teach, free drawing, alternating with lettering, clay modeling, and solid geometry. It was educating the old-fashioned way, with leather straps as teaching aids in a battle of wills waged relentlessly with casualties on both sides. I was unprepared for those early country days and weekends when Bill was away, sharing the room with drunks and tedious lonely Sundays when at a loose end I wandered the dreary empty streets. In reality, I was drifting, deceived into thinking I had what it takes to make teaching my career. A few weeks later, I flew to Melbourne and picked up a black F.J. Holden. On Friday nights, I drank beer with my colleagues until closing time at 6. Although over the border in NSW, such restrictions didn't exist. I began a romance with Jill, a student I drove home one day after school who had inadvertently missed her bus. One evening, parked by a lake, we got bogged and Jill had to phone her dad, who laconically towed us free. 
I left the hotel and rented rooms, then foolishly agreed to drive the landlady's son across the bridge to NSW, but stayed too long becoming involved in a drunken altercation with local thug who kept insisting I take off my coat and fight, which we eventually did, throwing punches, wrestling on the ground until separated, then scattering when warned the police were coming. As a result, my landlady was informed and icily asked me to leave, but I soon found refuge for a time with Bernie, my boozy colleague. I became friends with Helen, who arrived to catalog the school library. We kissed in her hotel lobby, but it became an ordeal when the same guest kept appearing and reappearing like a horse on a carousel. I moved to a primitive weatherboard shack on a turkey farm without hot water or refrigerator. On hot evenings, I'd drive into the forest and swim naked in the river. At the weekends, I played tennis on grass and drove into NSW to roam the paddocks and shoot at rabbits. I painted a portrait of the chemist's wife, aware my interpretation pleased he not a jot, and a private pupil who, unknown to me, was a notorious cheat, owed me money but refused to pay. I was among the teachers who escorted Ekika school children to the 1956 Melbourne Olympics by special train. From high in the stands, I ate sandwiches for lunch and vomited from food poisoning on board the train all the long way back. Going nowhere, as a temporary teacher, I decided I'd try to qualify to, for teacher training by painting pictures overseas. Helped by pomp, I booked a cabin on a cargo passenger ship sailing to England. London. From the deck, I watched the wharf recede as the pilot climbed aboard to navigate the Tintin Gale Castle and me out to sea. My cabin was one of six on the top deck with the officers to starboard and the dining saloon below. The gulls had left us long ago as we sailed, independent and alone, into the Indian Ocean. Bill and the brute from Queensland sitting on deck, sipping gins and tonics, having siestas every afternoon, watching magical sunsets, flying fish and iridescent waves with bingo in the evenings. We anchored outside Aden and were taken ashore by launch, to the brightly lit port where tall black policemen in blue shorts strolled by the duty-free shops. We sailed up the Red Sea to Port Suez, where Bill, the Brute, and I were driven to Cairo, crammed in the back seat of an unlicensed taxi in Nasser's Egypt. Bothered constantly by juvenile toots, who drank beer by the Nile, consumed the local food, urinated over a hole, sat around a hookah, puffing and sipping tea, while an elderly Arab offered us replicas of antiques from ex-King Farouk's palace, handcrafted fine inlay work in gold, silver, and mother of pearl. Laden with my large wall plaque, we drove back to Port Suez, where a launch shunted us back on board. We joined the convoy and sailed through the canal between banks of sand to Port Said, then into the Mediterranean Sea, through the Straits of Gibraltar, then around the Bay of Biscay into the English Channel to tie up at Calais. We spent a tipsy time ashore before crossing to the east coast of England, then north to the Port of Hull where I lingered for a while before taking a train to London and a room at the Strand Palace Hotel. To find my bearings, I roamed the streets and responded to ads for rooms to rent. Soho had an air of promiscuity with its illegal street walkers, sleazy bookshops, basement jazz clubs, and tawdry clip joints. One evening, plucking up courage, I propositioned a passing prostitute and followed as she walked away entering a building and climbed a flight of stairs. Casually, she attached a condom, then waited indifferently, sprawled on a double bed. After answering an ad, I rented three rooms on top of a lodging house at Streatham, then enrolled at Heatherley School of Art to paint portraits and nudes. I accepted an invitation from Bill to visit Yorkshire and tour the countryside. His friend, a former bus driver, drove us slowly, changing gears with great deliberation through the Yorkshire Dales and the Lake District, then north to sample Scotland's finest malt. I arranged to visit Florence taking the train to Dover, then the ferry to Calais, where I boarded the Rome Express. It stopped briefly at Paris, where I had a beer, then roamed the corridor in party mood and met a team of Irish water polo players. I joined them in their compartment, where we sang tunelessly and drank my duty-free scotch until I left in the early hours. Finding the connecting door locked, 
I was encouraged to step in onto a station platform as the train slowed, scurry ahead, and climb back on board. I awakened, the worse for wear, and gazed blearily at the blue Mediterranean passing below. I changed trains for the last leg to Florence, and then a taxi to the Anglo-American Hotel. I felt duty-bound to cross the Ponte Vecchio over the polluted Arno, admire Renaissance arch at the Pitti Palace, visit the Fusi, and gaze admirably at Michelangelo's David. Two weeks later, I took the train to Pisa and flew back to London to a temporary address before booking my passage home on another clan line ship, the Clan Sinclair, with an all Indian crew sailing via Suez again. Bill came down from Keeley to enjoy a parting glass before we sailed repeating the journey to Port Said, through the canal, down the Red Sea, past Aden, and into the Indian Ocean to anchor off Kokan, on the southern tip of India. Rowed ashore, we passed a beggar woman holding a child with an amputated hand. A few days later, we docked at Fremantle, and after visiting Perth, sailed around the Great Australian Bight to a very hot Adelaide. There was just enough time for a celebratory wink at sea, before tying up at Melbourne, early the next morning. Oliver's Hill. When Pop sold Bickley Vale, we moved to a new home at Frankston, on top of Oliver's Hill, overlooking Port Phillip Bay. I had a basement flat opening onto a lawn near a fish pond and a swimming pool. Each day I traveled by train, then a tram to the teacher's college. One morning, I noticed my lost love Mary, like some miraculous mirage near the railway station. I approached expecting to meet her, but when I arrived, she wasn't there. Feeling wretched, I recalled her last words over the telephone. I loved you, I love you, and I will always love you. I adored her, but all I could do was continue searching until she vanished into the penumbra of my unhappy mind. I seemed to be groping for something out of reach because the aesthetics of creativity seemed alien to me. The masses embraced loud sounds, sex and tribal sporting contests, not works of art or the harmonies of Bach. There seemed little need for creativity within the essence of our lives, dictated by the corporate mind. After graduation, I remained at Frankston's Tech for a few more years until promoted. Pop bought the house next door for my brother Peter, his wife and children, and I moved to Carm in an upstairs unit overlooking the bay. Most mornings, I jog along the water's edge, swim out to sea, have breakfast, then drive my VW Beetle to Dang Anong Tech, where I was deputy department head. One day, Dave, young and newly married, a disciplinarian, taught as a bowstring snapped, and admitted himself to the hospital next door. Untreated for several days, he jumped off the top floor and died. Teaching the modern way was all about free expression, experimenting with materials, abstractions, and mobiles, tinkling and wafting around. The system changed within a year when my classification became redundant and my promotion meaningless. I was back at the beginning in a time warp, without a future, going through the motions, trying to be innovative and adapt to inspire with enthusiasm I didn't possess. Vietnam divided the country with our government going all the way with Nixon, Kennedy, and LBJ. Pop retired, bought another house with acres of land to develop as a nursery with Peter as manager. My youngest brother, John, graduated from ANU with an arts degree. One wet lunchtime, I noticed a boy in the back of my classroom sitting at, on the guillotine. I told him to get off, which he did, then to my surprise, stormed outside. The resentment festered like an open wound, and he became my nemesis, a sociopath, the product of an unstable home. At times, I'd rant and rave, but he'd look away as if I wasn't there. Teaching had become like a TV commercial for me, with clones and classes appearing tediously every day. Apathetic and devoid of ambition, I struggled to finish my 15th year, explaining in an interview as best I could why I couldn't continue. Superannuated and glad to be free, I spent my days happily enough painting watercolors, but it wasn't to last. Carl. The stress from teaching didn't fade, but developed into depression, a 
twilit world of forgotten days and merging moments, one gloomy afternoon I took a taxi to a psychiatric clinic. I dreaded the dawn, heralded by a flute playing somewhere outside and the amplified telephone we were expected to answer. After cheerless breakfasts, we exercised by initiation, then imitation, before going for a stroll. On weekend leave, determined never to return, I slit a wrist and telephoned for an ambulance. I agreed when Pop suggested I work at the nursery in the glass house potting plants and setting seed. My mother had a genetic disability causing her to lose balance, sometimes fall and break bones. In and out of hospital, she grew gradually weaker, lost her mind, and passed away. Pop contracted Parkinson's disease and managed for a while, unwilling to hire a nurse, but alone at night, he sometimes collapsed beside his bed, unable to move. I visited him at the hospital one last time, but he didn't say a word, and soon after died. Due to the side effects of antidepressants affecting my coordination, I was admitted to hospital for tests. But after discharge, at the mercy of cold turkey, I descended into a personal purgatory which continued when a new drug failed until a new prescription finally worked. I remember listlessly watching the 2000 Sydney Olympics on TV and sitting by the window attempting to read Remembrance of Things Past. John sold his inheritance, the home, on top of Oliver's Hill. Uncle Ken. Disenchanted, I preferred the anonymity of the night and ceased to swim in what seemed to me a reproachful sea. Perched on a chair, I drank, watched awful movies on TV, and slept late to lay the day. I'd walk past disinterested houses across a bridge over a creek to watch the ducks, but at times I'd lose my balance and weave uncontrollably. Nervously, I prepared to cross a road and staggered over, collapsing on the other side. An x-ray and a scan revealed I had a tumor on the brain. Within days, I was in a hospital room wearing a back-to-front surgical gown, talking to a nun who left me with feelings of peace and serenity. I regained consciousness in the recovery ward, deaf in the right ear, and with a headache, followed by another operation when my bladder failed. Transferred to rehab with a catheter attached to a plastic bag, I had to learn to walk again and urinate normally. I became friends with Maria a Vietnam refugee who owned the Karam General Store and her five daughters, Elizabeth, Anne-Marie, Evelyn, Teresa, and Margaret. Jody Cooley from Red Hill South became my muse, critic and lifelong friend. I began to jog again and swim backwards out to sea, bittern. I tried to help Maria escape her loss, making legacy by helping her to qualify as a masseuse before opening a business but she seemed more intrigued by a lottery scam created by Evelyn and Elizabeth. She diverted a check I made out to her into Evelyn's account, but she and Elizabeth lost the lot, shut up shop, and disappeared. I realized the only way to get my money back was to invest in Evelyn by purchasing jewelry at an auction in the U.S. and selling for a profit in Australia. Evelyn gave birth to Alfred and Margaret, begged me for a loan, claiming she had been defrauded. Since she seemed desperate, I agreed, then foolishly signed a year's lease for her hairdressing business and became the proprietor of a loss-making enterprise. With Margaret managing, I joined my mate Harry on a plane to Dubai from where he flew to Manchester and I to London. I booked a coach tour of Europe, but my troubles began in Amsterdam, in the red-light district where my passport was stolen. I had to travel along the Autobahn by taxi, past the Black Forest to the Australian consulate in Frankfurt. Worn out and wheezing, I carted my luggage to the railway station and bought a ticket to Prague. Unable to continue due to bronchitis, I left the tour at Vienna to fly back to London, exhausted, sleeping a lot in my hotel before the flight to Dubai, where I met Harry and we flew home together. My hairdressing business was losing thousands, casually every week, and I learned after a colonoscopy I had bowel cancer. Evelyn drove me to a hospital for keyhole surgery and a diet of crushed ice for a week, then six months of chemotherapy, scans, and blood tests. Dramatically, Evelyn and her husband Stephen were charged with fraud and stood forlornly, side by side in the dock at their committal hearing, unable to get bail. Found guilty, they are sentenced to three years. Away from their children, and as an unsecured creditor, all my assets were confiscated. Finally free, the nightmare over, we began to re-establish our lives together. My brother, Peter, died in a hospice 
when bowel cancer spread to his liver. I decided to leave my car room unit, my then decrepit and eventually found an ideal property at Bittern in the countryside where in the evenings rabbits nibbled the grass beside lorikeets and magpie geese. Depression. The Bittern property with a home and land was like a dream where I set seed, grew vegetables, began a compost, heat, planted a lemon tree in a new environment so real to me yet like a mirage I failed to see it was all illusory. The conflict between fantasy and reality eventually began to clash and I passed through long and dreary days unwillingly and apathetically. Prescribed antidepressants, I had to wait existing somehow emotionless as an empty shell. When sleep retreated, I unwillingly awakened, possessed by the curse of consciousness, hoping each day tomorrow would be better. I spent three weeks recovering at a psychiatric hospital, visited by Evelyn and Stephen, who renovated and sold my car and unit. Then the Bittern property, before finding a suitable home at Leicesterfield, where we could live together. When Indonesia invaded East Timor, the Australian government looked the other way. Four journalists, four Australians, and one New Zealander were murdered at Balabo. For 25 years, successive governments pandered to the genocidal Suharto regime, 